All right, recording in progress. <laughs> That's what it told me. So it looks like I got to clean that a little bit. Oh, good. How does it possibly get dirty? Um, that's the main question. Nobody touches the camera on the, on the computer and it gets dirty all the time. I think the cats come in here, put their paw prints on it. So um, let's get jumping right into our topic today, which is the think about it objection. And if you've been in network marketing for more than five minutes, you've had this objection. <laughs> so it's a big issue. I mean, I think for everybody, but it's one of my favorites because there are indicators as to why we get this objection, which I'll get into in a little bit. But, you know, I've done live presentations and online presentations for 20 years for the network marketing industry. And I will tell you, this is luckily not one that I get a lot, but I've had this one even with my coaching business and talking to clients or prospective clients about that. And because that is a lot, I guess you'd say heavier and people want more information about it and stuff like that, you'll often hear it if you do certain things, which I, like I said, I'll get into in just a second. But a little bit about me in case this is your first time watching, um, I'm Jen Springer and I've been in network marketing since 2001. And I look at the, the calendar and the dates of things and I can't even believe where, how long I've been in this industry. I was a guest yesterday on a clubhouse for uh, a friend of mine and, you know, us talking about our history and our experience. And I'm like, oh, I'm one of those people who's been there, done that now. And uh, I, it, I think about it. I could have kids graduating college and getting married for as long as I've been in this industry. So, you know, there, the thing is with this, I, I firmly believe that, you know, the people that make it in this industry, you know, they everybody wants the secret, right? They want the secret to know what to say during objections, which I'll get into. Uh, they want to know how to talk to people. They want to find the prospects. Where are they all hiding? You know, what's the magic thing that's going to grow my business? And I'm going to say there, you know, doing this, um, I could tell you there is no magic thing. It's elbow grease. Elbow grease. And what is that, right? Some people know exactly what that is. Other people do not know. When you, you ever polished a car, um, and nowadays, most people don't do that. I mean, it used to be a thing, but in, in order to get that car clean and shiny with wax, you'd have to use what we call elbow grease, right? You got to use your hands to buff and there's no way around a hand washed and hand buffed car when it's got the wax on there and it's just gleaming in beautiful, rich color. And it's the same for when you accidentally leave the eggs in your frying pan and they cooled off and dried. You can't get those eggs out unless you use a little elbow grease and work. And it's the same with our business. We are, you know, we're in an industry where the rampant culture of this industry is fast, quick, make money fast, grow a fast team. This company is growing fast. We're the best and greatest, latest, you know, on the market. And then we keep coming out with new products like that too. And it's always this paste, which is, you know, something that helps create excitement and momentum. But the problem is there is a, a mentality that is like, tell four people and you're going to get rich and retire. And you'll, you'll do that in 90 days, by the way. And that's just not true. And the, the way to growing your business and your team and duplication is through a lot of work consistently every day for weeks, months, years until you hit your goal. And when you hit that goal, the big hairy goals, we like to call it, how do you keep going and maintaining that volume? You often have to put your team and your, you know, your business on maintenance, you know, like this, you know, grow your team and retire thing. 
it'll last so long, but it will, you know, slip back over time, typically, um, you know, even if you just maintain it with a log every so every so often is like if you have a fireplace, right, you put in a log, you get it stoked, and then it goes right and then you to keep the fire going all night you put in another log and another log but you just put it in let it go and it's kind of the same thing once you get your business to a major size but you know one of um you know my greatest uh observations of this industry is that i think what hurts the industry the most is this preconceived notion of um you know this is going to grow overnight and you're going to retire next week and that's not true. Um, the other thing is that everybody is your prospect, which is not true either. And sometimes when we get objections, it's because we are talking to the wrong prospects. It does happen. I know the three foot rule of network marketing doesn't always apply, even though your upline says it does. And we have to find the right prospects. That is really interesting. Um, I'm helping a friend with a campaign right now. And every time she gets off the phone after she closes somebody, she says, Jen, that gal I just enrolled is amazing. Like, I can't even believe these leads that you are helping us get through the Facebook ads. And I'm like, we're finding the right people. And it's not everybody. You know, if we if we have 20 leads come in and one is the right one, that's all that matters is the one that is the right one instead of getting upset or chasing and chasing the 19 that aren't the right ones. Okay. So having the right prospect is a big deal. And in, you know, in this industry, we're told to talk to everybody, which is actually, there's good and bad with that. You know, you know, when you get into your business, you make your list of people, pretend this is a list, you make your list of people and you go through that list and then you you often get really discouraged and you want to quit or you're good at talking to these people and then you get into your next layer of your network and you start to meet others and then you start to get really tired <laughs> and you keep talking and talking and talking but all these people are they all the best prospect and to some degree yes and some degree no when we make that first list of people that we know. I invite people in my team to categorize those people. Some of them straight up are a great prospect for the business. Some straight up are a great prospect for the products or services that you offer. And then there's others that are neither, or maybe who knows, right? But those people are what, are what I call connectors. Those are ones that might lead me to another person. It might lead me to a referral or a place to do presentations or a network of people that I could tap into. So I call them like connectors. And some people are in the middle and they belong to many of those. But if we take some of those prospects and they are not the best fit, and then we try to shove the business on them, then they're going to give us objections. I need to think about it. I need to talk to my spouse. I don't know. I don't have the time. When I hear that one, I know that's the biggest load of crap that ever existed, ever. Like if any of you are ever talking to me and you tell me the time objection, I'll probably just like throw, I don't know, rotten eggs at you or something. <laughs> I don't know. Like that to me is the lamest thing ever because I know that's bullshit, like class A bullshit. When someone says, I don't have time you know what you do, um, you, you just got to figure out how much you've got, you know, you're better off consistently putting in two hours every week in your business every week, than 20 hours in one weekend, once every two months. Okay, so don't give me that. <laughs> so, you know, when you hear, you know, the objections, um, they it was so interesting about them is that they tell you what is really going on with the conversation that you're having. And there's only three real things that are going on in the prospect's mind when you're showing them your business product, service, you know, whatever it is that you're, however you're leading. And they're, they're only thinking three things. They're thinking, can I do this? Is this legitimate? will this work for me? 
And there's a trust factor in there, but that goes with the legitimate thing. So always remember when you hear an objection, can I do this? Because in their mind, if they think they can't, you're going to hear some crappy ass objection. I have no money. Well, you just went to Disney two weeks ago. <laughs> is this legitimate? And that's a trust thing. That could be, is the company legitimate? Is the industry legitimate? Are you legitimate? It's like trust. Is There's a trust thing. And then the third thing is, can uh, will this work for me? I was just like, I forgot where order I was in. Will this work for me? And I will tell you that the answer is, um, you know, if it's not clear on these things, then they we're going to hear that type of objection. So it's just a fact. It's a matter of how we operate as humans. So if there's any underlying resolve, unresolve with any of these things, we, we're going to hear objections. And the objection that, you know, we're going to talk about today, I need to think about it. Um, it there's there's some very uh, distinct roots in which this one comes. And so one thing I want to say is in the next couple of weeks, keep your eyes peeled. A friend of mine who is a master recruiter of the network marketing industry has enrolled tens of thousands of people in his 25 years in the industry. We're going to be doing a prospecting and closing uh, troubleshooting type of uh, uh, event. <laughs> I've got it scheduled right now for uh, a date coming up and I'm not going to say the date. You will know ASAP. Um, stay tuned on this page or drop a comment under this uh, to get that information. I've already put some feelers out. I've got people, I know this is going to be something people want to know is opening up conversations handling objections. What do you say? How do you invite people to go to your presentation and get them to say yes or to show up? So we're going to get into that. And it's going to be, like I said, in the next probably two weeks, maybe three, but probably two. We've got a date set, but I might want to tweak that date for a couple of reasons. So um, one of the things we're going to go into are more on the objections, but I wanted to do this one. This one was scheduled. This training was scheduled before I even thought about doing that because as I work with my clients and I talk to people just in general in the industry about uh, the, you know, their business growth, I, I can help them find leads and I can help them without a question, get their pipeline full of prospects, whether they want to for the business or the product. But I find that once people start getting these prospects, they don't know what to say. And I'm like taken back because I thought that their upline would show them or their company or things like that. And I'm finding that's not true. And it, it very much bothers me. So um, you're going to see me working on and focusing on, on some of this with how to talk to people and what to say, how to get them started, how to get them over objections. Why do you get objections? Things like that. And this first one of, you know, I need to think about it. Where, you know, where does it come from? And always remember an objection is something that is given and it's often not the real thing. Occasionally it will, but a very, like a 25% chance that the objection you're hearing is actually the real objection. And the I want to think about an objection comes from a couple different places. And I have my notes right here. Um, one is the straight up what we, I just talked about a minute ago is we didn't establish trust. And what do I mean by establishing trust? So there's some reason that the prospect isn't quite trusting you or the company. And why could that happen? You know, one is over inflated promises. You know, this is super galactic moon juice and this is gonna cure everything that you've ever happened in your life that was bad, erase all your bad memories, put in good ones. And from here forward, you're gonna make a million dollars a year. There's some trust factors. So there might be something that 
was in the presentation or a conversation with the pre, you know, the prospect that raised some flags about the trust factor, which is, you know, legitimate, especially companies that are new, um, may be seem good, too good to be true. Um, you know, if you're leading with the business, you sometimes we inadvertently say things that sound like, you know, either oh, like I said, over promising or we don't. Um, uh, we have a bad day and it comes out sideways. I've had that. I did a call with somebody the other day and I was like, God, that was terrible. I was tired and I had a headache, you know? So that happens too, even to the best of us, <laughs> you know, like, whoops, you hang the phone up and you're like, dang, that was not good. Uh, hopefully it came off better than I thought it did. Um, so there, there's a trust factor that maybe was not established and the prospect will say, I need to think about it because they need to think about if they trust you or the company or even, you know, the industry. But I really think that the industry itself has become so much more, uh, you know, um, accepted than it used to be. Um, even when I came in 20 years ago, we had done some great shifting into making this a professional type of industry. Uh, versus, you know, garage full of products and come to my roast beef dinner and you can't leave until you enroll kind of industry. But it, you know, the, that objection can be rooted in trust. So how do you fix that? Well, I'm going to get into the, these in a little bit, but that, how do you fix these things? I got to go through what causes it first. Um, the second thing is when they say I need to think about it, the objection might be as easy as you gave them too much to think about. You know, they wanted to get certain, you know, bits of information and you brought that to them, but there was then the threshold of, okay, that's enough information. And then I, it, it goes into the too much information. And then once people start to get overloaded and they've got all these ideas and things, they, they need to think about it. And they truly, now their brains are like, burr, they melted and they truly need to think about it. And so that is um, straight up the facts. <laughs> I just have to tell you, there are um, situations that, uh, you know, people, certain, certain personality types are more apt to say, I need to think about it because I need more information or I need to digest the information that you gave me. Um, if you're familiar with the personality colors or gems or, you know, there's different, um, basically the same thing repackaged in multiple different ways as far as the personality types. You know, there's the, the driver, which is like a red or a ruby, you know, people teach it different ways. I actually learned all of these in two different ways, one or three, one was with gems, one was with colors. And then when I went to teach uh uh, college uh, courses, they did the same thing, but all the colors were flipped. And I was like, oh my gosh, I learned it one way with different. <laughs> so, so you might have learned it a different way, but there's the driver, there's the helper, which is the yellow or the pearl. There is the, uh, I guess you say the life of the party or the, the, you know, the, um, the energetic one, which is the blue or the sapphire, you could hear it that way. And I think in that other one, it was a green. It really screwed me up when they, it was the opposite colors. And then the last one is the analytical or the, the green, or they call them emeralds. And the, the, the green personality or the analytical, that type of person is going to need more information. They may need to think about it. They want to do their research. And you know, it, it, there is a percentage of the population that's like that. You know, I'm a heavy green, uh, you know, depending on what, if I know what I want, I know it when I see it and I make a decision. If people present the right information to me and connect the logic as to why I need to get that thing or join that thing or whatever, I'm in. But if I'm new into uh, a situation like, let's just say buying appliances, right? I want to do a little bit of research and make sure I'm getting the right fridge, right? That I want the best for the money, the warranty, yada, yada. So I, I'm most likely not going to walk into the store and walk right out with that unless I really know what I want, which 
you know, I've gathered information over time, but that that group of the population that is the analytical or research type, they will need more information. They, they, it's highly likely they're going to need to think about it. So if you're not a green and you are impatient, a red, which is my you know primary uh, one, the the driver, you may get frustrated with these people. But how do you know if you are talking to somebody who is truly that type of person? So when they give you the objection, how do you know that is them? Well, when you are a good prospector, you will have more of a conversation about them than you. And you'll find things out about them, like what did they go to school for? Or what do they do for a living? Or you know, what are some of their hobbies? And if you asked me what, you know, in a conversation, about my career in history. And, you know, if you knew about me, you would know I'm a scientist and I went to school for that. And I, you know, have in health, you know, um, health and wellness. And I love teaching and I love to, uh, I practice for many years. And so I love learning. So when you hear some of these things, you can kind of know this person might be an analytical type. But be cautious not to provide too much information. And I'll get into that in a second. Um, the other thing is when you're um, dealing with personalities that are engineers, scientists, accountants, uh, you know, things of that nature, real heady, real left brained, those people are going to want more information. But how do you handle that? How do you know? when is enough or when is too much and i'll i'll get into that in a second because you generally you we often give too much like someone will leave your live presentation with like a stack of papers of handouts too much information okay uh, if you're doing an overview online and you are you know putting somebody in a facebook group with tons and, tons and tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of videos and handouts and downloads, you might have overwhelmed them. So you're not holding back information because you're being deceitful. It's just that you don't want to fire hose somebody and give them brain melt. I mean, literally brain melt. And it was one of the tactics I unknowingly used and it actually worked. When I did live presentations, I would literally like overwhelm them so much and make myself look so smart that they they joined because they thought they had to and honestly I never duplicated early on in my business because I was a walking encyclopedia that could recite the first four chapters out of our reference book <laughs> and uh you know science brain put to work but it wasn't handy because not everybody like is that way and maximum 25 percent of the population is I think it's more like 10 percent truly is that way. So you have to uh, be mindful of how much information you truly give out. <laughs> and you have to know your audience, especially when you yourself are an analytical, you need to refrain from giving people stacks and stacks of information and attachment and an attachment of information if you're doing it digitally, or if you're presenting live, you have to hold back and not go geeky on everybody. Okay. Ask me how I know. So that, you know, it can be rooted truly in that, you know, you've got to be very, um, very, very mindful of giving them too much. Okay. It's very, very likely that happened. So know when you're doing your presentations, if you're finding that the majority of your presentation is about facts and your data and your patented whatever nanotechnology or things of that nature, you, you might want to rein it in a little bit. Okay. Um, and then the third thing that I find is what causes this objection is I said it earlier is they don't think it's going to work. And whether it's the business or the product, whether they think they're going to be able to grow and reach their goals, or it's the business as far as, um, you know, whether the company, like I said, is legitimate or they aren't 
sure if they themselves have the ability to do it. It may seem hard, you know, like when I grew my business, I did trade shows every weekend. And if somebody's in the audience thinking, oh my God, I would rather stand in front of a bus than do this every weekend. I'm away from my family. It's the only time I have with them. I, I would never, I like this business. I like this idea, but I don't want to do that. I, I don't think I can do that. And I don't think this is going to work for me. So they'll give the objection instead of saying to you, Jen, I don't want to go every weekend to a, a, an expo or trade show. I'm going to tell you, I need to think about it. The, I need to think about it. Objection is the easiest one for people to feel okay with giving. I need to think about it. When you hear the, I need to talk to my spouse, that's a different one. That's a different training. But the, I need to think about it one is the most unobtrusive, easy one for people to say, because they, they feel like, you know, if I say that it's, it's true because they're telling themselves, well, maybe I do need to think about it. So they're believing that. And it's also the one that they feel is the most accepted. So they'll say that. But really, there is a hard objection underneath it. There was something in the presentation or something that you might have said personally or their experience when they came or beforehand, if you were doing it online, that may have set this up. Or it might be that they don't believe they can do it themselves. Like they don't think they have it in them to do, which could be a skill issue. Like, how will I know how to do this? How will I know what to say? How will I know enough about the product or service in order to do you know, a presentation or share with somebody? So that's what's really going on with them. But they're not going to say that. They're going to say, I need to think about it because they need to think about, can I do this? Is this, you know, can, can I do it? And, and that may have been able to be addressed in the presentation or in the conversation following up, which will be important after you invite somebody to a live overview is to follow up and, you know, check in with people that went different conversation, different day. So those are the main, you know, the main reasons. Of course, there's more, but how, how do you handle this? You know, how do you go from, um, you know, objection to getting somebody started? Well, the first thing is you need to realize that most of the time the objection was created during the a presentation or a conversation or, a, you know, before you got to, to the actual objection. So one way to handle this, I think, and I will always say this, is you telling more stories, more testimonials than facts. Though again, you always hear me say it, facts tell, stories sell. So make sure that when you're doing your presenting, whether it's a one-on-one, -on -one, through a Zoom or a one on one on the phone, or you're sitting across a table from somebody or whatever, or it could be a live, you know, online. You know, it could be a, a presentation that is in front of a group audience live. Make sure that you're telling stories and, and you might even write in your little outline tell story, tell story, tell story, because we forget. We think that the most important thing that the prospect needs to know is about how awesome this thing is and all the features and the benefits and how it's patented and, you know, it's sourced this way. And we think that's what is making the decision for, you know, in their mind, but it's not. So they want to know, will it work for them? Can they do it? Is this legitimate? And we do that through telling stories and testimonials. So always remember those and remember to tell your own and, and make sure you're not telling a story like I started last week and now I'm giving my notice to my job because I made so much money. They're going to be like, that ain't like sound right. You know, I rubbed this cream on my body and like I turned back the clock by 40 years in three days. They're not going to believe that. 
So those kinds of stories are not like legit, right? But you know what I'm saying? Tell legitimate stories and especially ones that are very relatable, maybe people that struggled, maybe people that, you know, came through and they had to think about it and they waited and then they regretted waiting too long, you know, stuff like that. You might want to even handle the objection right on in the presentation. So, you know, pull back on the, the facts, get in more stories into your presentation of people that succeeded. Okay. Or people that might've had objections and they, they were able to come through you know, you can talk about that, you know, it's just a fact. We, we see it all the time. You know, we see it, especially if you offer certain packages, you know, certain prices, $100, $500, $1,000 packages. And everybody always says, I want to do the big one. And then they do like a smaller one. And then later they, every one of them says they regret not doing the biggest package because it was the one that gave them the most information and the most experience with the product to be able to grow their business. And they wish they had done that, you know, that type of reason, you know, that type of story. So when you're right, especially if you're a, a analytical personality, you have to really might be mindful of this. Um, take your presentation and cut out three quarters of the factoids. <laughs> so however you're presenting, if you're presenting live, or you're sending, if you're sending more than one attachment to somebody through a messenger or a text or a, an email to get them uh, what they want, you're sending too much. Okay. Brief, couple bullet points. And if for those people who are analyticals, you can tell them if you would like more information beyond this. Let me know specifically what you're looking for. I will point you in that direction. Okay. I will often for the analyticals, when I was presenting live, I would go through things very surface um, on the products because the product that I was presenting on was very sciencey. And like you could have degrees and certifications in order to use this or, you know, use this as a business but you had to avoid going there and sounding like one of those people, which was hard for me because I was one of those people. But I would say directly into the you know people in the room, if you're the type of person that wants to know all the research and all the data, come see me afterwards. I'll point you in that direction. And you know what was interesting? Nobody ever asked. Isn't that telling? They never asked. Even though I knew I had taught this you know, one overview, probably thousands of times, not understanding that. And when I switched to saying that in the presentation, you know, I'll be like, so this is, you know, like really this and that, and, you know, we take it and, you know, this is uh, an acupressure ring and it's made out of brass, I think, and you roll it on your finger and it does all those little points and it helps just balance you out. But if you would like to know the meridian points of what it's stimulating and, you know, what really is going on with this and why it works, I, I'll see if I can get it for you. See me after the presentation because I geek out on that stuff too. And, and guess what? When you say that, even in the presentation, they, they don't ask. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Um, and you're calling out the objection right there. I mean, that's, that's the reason why. Because they, they, oh yeah, yeah, she recognizes that I might want to know more. It's actually like a subconscious thing. It's really weird. But in your live presentations, if you're hearing, I need to think about it too much in your presentations, it's because you are telling them too much. You need to cut like 75% of what you think is necessary to tell them and get it out of what you're giving to people. Okay. It's just truth. So how do you remedy this? More stories, more testimonials, get rid of like 75% of your facts. Um, and then the last thing I'm going to leave you with is when somebody gives you that objection, you know, what's the best way to handle it? And the truth is when someone says, I need to think about it, well, the best way to think about it is to get some of the product right? The best way to think about it is let's get you some product. 
If you, you like it, great. If you don't, you'll know. And you talk about like a return policy, whatever your return policy is. But truthfully to say, you know, I need to think about it and they go home with a bunch of papers. How are they going to know how the product or the service is going to work for them? They don't. They're going to go home and they're not ever going to call you back unless you call them back and handle the objection. So when someone says, and you can call this out at the end of your presentation, whether it's live on the, the, the Zooms or the phone, or if it's in presentation mode in person, you can say, so at the end of the presentation, you can call it out. And you know what, if you're here, you're thinking, oh my gosh, I need to think about it. Great. We know exactly how you need to think about it. Let's get you some of the product or service or whatever it is. Let's get you started. See if it's something you can get behind. If it's something that you um, you can do. And the only way to know that is to get the super galactic moon juice and try it for 30 days. You know what I'm saying? So that is the best objection. If somebody, you know, when, when I do a close, there's three different types. I create three different ways for somebody to get started. And it's usually a small, medium, and large package. And the ones that aren't finding themselves in one of those packages, the think about it's great. Let's get you something. Let's get you started. And have in your mind something that is simple and very powerful for them to get started with that you know they're going to love and they're going to see results from. And pick that thing and, and have it already in your mind. Don't say, well, okay. So you want to think about it, the, you know, what are you thinking? And they're going to be like, I'm thinking a lot. <laughs> and then they're still going to be overwhelmed and confused. So what you say is great. You know, if you want to think about it, let me, you know, let me make a couple of recommendations that we found that people who want to try the product or the service uh, find that these are the best things for them to know if this is going to work for them. So we've got this and we got that, you know, what, what, you know, where do you see yourself getting started? Amazing. Right. So that is the best way to handle the objection straight on is telling them that they need to get started with the product or the service. Because there's no way they're going to be able to know by looking at their papers and the notes they took, unless they're going to do more research. But if you did a good enough presentation, they usually don't need that. You know, you've handled objections, you've told the stories, you kept it simple. So now they have everything that they need. They need the product or the service and then get them started. Okay. So that's the best way to handle that. But I hope that this was helpful. You know, I don't want to go in much more than this because this is about this particular objection. And just remember when you hear it or any objection over and over, especially if it's a theme, if you hear it frequently, there's something absolutely that you're doing that is causing this to happen. And we've got to step back and take a look at what we're saying, how we're presenting, what, how, what are we doing that might be causing that objection? It's for many years, I've never had the, I need to talk to my spouse about it ever. I never had the, is this, you know, a pyramid scheme ever, 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 you know, I very rarely heard, I can't afford it um, every now and then, but it was not a theme at all. If I was to get an objection, most likely it was, I need to think about it or it's not for me right now, which is cool. I'd respect that. You know, someone says that, but in general, it was typically this one. And why? Because I'm an analytical type. I like to provide lots of information so people can make a good decision. Well, it confuses them. That's what it really does. <laughs> it confuses them. So with that, I'm going to wrap up on that. Um, I'm going to, I can do a quick uh, recap on this. Um, so if you hear this a lot, you gave them too much to think about. You didn't establish trust and they don't believe it'll work. That's the root of this objection. And then by handling it, tell more stories, get rid of like 75% of the facts in your presentation 
and then tell them to get started on the product or the service. So that it'd be directive because people that say they want to think about it, their heads are like spinning. You need to be very, very clear and give them a clear path that is simple to get started. You say, this is what people often will do to, you know, to get started because of this, let's get you going. End of story. Okay. So be directive. All right. So I will adjourn with this again. This is Jen Springer and next week. I forgot what my topic is. I know it's in here. You can look under the events. You can see what we've got going on, but um, we've got more to come. Stay tuned for the announcement on our live training we're going to do about this topic even more so uh, my friend tom challen and i are going to do that he is a master recruiter you're not going to want to miss it it is going to be something i know i've seen so many people have breakthroughs after working with tom um, including myself um, he helped me master the phone skills he's one of those people and, and being able to sponsor like crazy um, i was always good in person um, but we can always be better, like always be better. And when it came to refining uh, my presentations to have even better results, he was the one that helped me with that. And I've known him for a long time and you're definitely going to want to, to get in on this when we do it. So keep your eyes peeled for that. And then I will put some training links above in this training here um, so that you can learn more about, you know, running ads. And if, when we get that link up for the, the uh, training we're going to do on the prospecting and closing, I'll put that up there too. So I will see you guys soon. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks for dialing in, tuning in, whatever you're doing in, <laughs> you know, share this with others, add them to this group. If you're watching the rebroadcast and we're on uh, YouTube or whatever, you know, share this away and send this out to your teams. This is a very important thing because you know what, if you've been in this business for five minutes, you've probably had this objection at some point. We'll see you guys later.